My name is Brian Havel. I'm director of the International Aviation Law Institute at DePaul University in Chicago. This is the seventh event in the Institute's special oral history series, Conversations with Aviation Leaders, in which we talk about the origins, the history, and the record of US airline deregulation with academics, officials, public figures, industry leaders who've played a significant role in this extraordinary public policy experiment. Now, our previous conversations have focused on historical developments in airline passenger travel. And we've not explored in any detail the circumstances particular to the deregulation and evolution of air cargo transport. We're redressing that omission this afternoon on the grand scale. The Institute has gone on a field trip to Memphis, Tennessee, to the global headquarters of the FedEx Corporation. We're sitting in a custom-built studio on the FedEx campus, and we're privileged indeed that our interviewee is Frederick W. Smith, the founder, chairman, and CEO of FedEx, the world's first and largest overnight express delivery company. A Yale classmate of Secretary of State John Kerry and a former US President George W. Bush, he famously formulated the idea of FedEx as an assignment for an undergraduate economics class. After school, he became a highly decorated Marine and served in the Marine Corps. He founded Federal Express in 1971. The name Federal Express, as it then was, is derived in part from a failed attempt, apparently, to secure a contract to deliver checks for the Federal Reserve System. Anyone familiar with the company's history will know that FedEx is a quintessential part of US president of business law. And Fred Smith did not allow any of his early setbacks to stand in his way. He took on the patchwork of regulations that affected air cargo transport and express delivery services. He testified before Congress on dozens of occasions regarding various deregulation proposals. And by the early 90s had become quite a fixture on the congressional scene. Those early testimonies form a crucial part of what we will be talking about here in Memphis this afternoon. Fred Smith has won numerous awards and distinctions, including the 2011 Tony Janus Award for outstanding leadership in the commercial aviation industry. Our format will be approximately three 50-minute sessions in which we will talk successively about the emergence of the initial experience of airline deregulation. Then we look at the post-deregulation era and the influence of deregulation on the restrictive regime that governed, and still governs to some extent, international air transport. And finally, we'll have some overall perspectives and retrospectives and look at some specific regulatory issues. Anyway, that's the theory. It's really up to my guest, Fred Smith. I'm, in a sense, his guest here in Memphis as to how this conversation will unfold. Welcome, Fred. Thank you very much, Brian. Let's begin on April the 17th, 1973. You have 10 small planes and 18 packages. What's the regulatory regime under which you're proposing to start your business? You know, the um, regulatory authority that FedEx began operation under uh, was Part 298 of the Civil Aeronautics Regulations. And uh, 298 governed the non-regulated portion of the, uh, of the industry. Uh, as you undoubtedly know, and, and people interested enough to watch this will know, the industry uh, was uh, initially regulated back in the 1930s. Um, at the end of World War II in 1944, the Chicago Convention was held that governed the, uh, the rules for commercial aviation in a post-World War II environment. And the regulatory regime, uh, which existed in the United States for many years, uh, required any uh, air carrier that wanted to serve the, the public in the United States, whether it was to move uh, people or goods, to meet the test of public convenience and necessity, as they called it. Right. And um, I may be off here a bit in my chronology, but I think it was 1938 or thereabout when the, when the regulatory regime uh, 
was instituted in, in the U.S. That's and exactly the, the right year. Was it good? Well, yeah. my, uh, my memory's fading, but, <laughs> but I, some things are burned in it. And um, the legacy carriers that were granted these uh, certificates of public convenience and necessity uh, remained uh, the industry, uh, with a couple of exceptions, from 1938 into the 1970s. Mm. And uh, the importance of that is it was virtually impossible to prove the public could be its necessity uh, in this heavily regulated, very uh, lawyer-driven uh, system because the public convenience and necessity was already adequately served uh, according to the incumbents, many of, of whom exist today. I mean, United and, and American and uh, many others have, have gone away, like Pan American and TWA and things you've talked about in previous interviews with right. people that were uh, involved in the situation. There were two exceptions, um, uh, uh, actually uh, uh, three after the 38 Act. There were some supplemental air carriers, charter carriers that were permitted to operate uh, there were some all-cargo carriers, most notably Seaboard and the Flying Tiger Line and a few others. And then uh, there were regional carriers that would uh, serve with relatively small airplanes, mm -hmm. um, uh, upstate Michigan and uh, outback Montana and so forth. There was a threshold at the very bottom of the food chain, so to speak, where small airplanes below a certain size could operate without having a federal license. Now, you were still subject to the safety regulations of the FAA. Was it size or weight? In, in, uh, this is where my memory is uh, getting a little, um, a little off. I, I, as I recall, the original exemption was for aircraft of 12,500 pounds gross takeoff weight or mm. lower. Right. So uh, in the early 1970s, uh, there began a, a movement uh, which had been pushed for a long time to raise this exemption uh, and do away with the gross takeoff weight limit and instead substitute a passenger limit or a payload limit because technology had, had made airplanes different than mm -hmm. uh, the old 12.5 uh, weight would accommodate. Now, the reason people were trying to change uh, this section of the regulations had nothing to do with what FedEx did at all. It was to allow jitney operations, say somebody to fly from Boston to Cape Cod or to fly uh, in upstate Maine where nobody, even the smallest certificated carriers, the regional carriers, wanted to fly. Jitney sounds like an Irish term. Do you mean the air taxi? Uh, the air taxi, taxi, I exemption. think that would be a better term. But the term, the, the term Jitney was actually used at the time, but I think you're probably right as, as I think about it. Air taxi was certainly a more uh, that may be descriptive the word. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what it was designed to do, was to allow people, if they needed it, to put in small airplanes, but bigger than the 12.5, but nothing that could compete with the, um, uh, with the certificated carrier. Certificated carrier. Yeah. That's right. So yeah. the FAA would give the safety. And, and you would pass. be exempt from economic regulation, because remember, with the Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity, even the smallest carriers, the so-called regionals like Southern and Ozark and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, people like that, uh, were uh, subject to economic regulation by the Civil Aeronautics Board, which right. governed economic regulation. So beneath this threshold, originally 12.5 gross takeoff weight, you weren't subject to economic regulations, but still subject to safety regulations. But you couldn't just start an airline. You would still have to seek an exemption, wouldn't you, from the civil aeronautics? Well, if you operated an airplane below 12,500 pounds prior to the change in Part 298, whenever that happened, you may know, but it was, it was, you could get the plane, and if you had the guts and the money and could satisfy the FAA that you would operate safely, uh, 
you could fly. And so people set up small sightseeing operations, you know, in the Grand Canyon, and people had nine passenger airplanes going out to the um, uh, Nantucket and, and uh, Cape Cod or whatever. So uh, there was a big push to change this regulation from the gross takeoff weight to a capacity limit. And the capacity limit that was selected was 30 passengers, uh, which was below significantly uh, even the smallest turboprops operated by the regional carriers, the Convairs and the Fairchild F-27s, which were uh, generally 56 seats. And uh, that was the change that permitted FedEx. Uh, now, uh, what we did with the Part 298 uh, operation certainly wasn't an air taxi, and it certainly wasn't a jitney service. It was a nationwide air express network, uh, which was never contemplated by the change in the regulations, but it permitted us to do what we wanted to do. And that was to set up a nationwide network that allowed the movement of critical goods from any point on the network to any point on the network overnight, or absolutely positively overnight is our iconic initial advertising uh, uh, touted. And the way uh, we did that was to take a small airplane, a jet, uh, the Dassault uh, uh, 20, or the Falcon as it came to be known, uh, which was very unusual for many other small jets in that it was actually designed to the specifications of Pan American World Airways. Uh, Charles Lindbergh had been a board member of Pan Am. Juan Tripp, the founder of Pan Am, wanted to be in the corporate business jet sector. Uh, uh, Learjet had come along and Jetstar was there. So he sent Charles Lindbergh around the world <coughs> to find an airplane that could be sold by Pan American um, but met the same rigorous airline standards uh, that Pan Am would, would get for its own trunk line airplanes. Right. And they came that close to doing a deal with de Havilland for the 125, and Charles Lindbergh met with, uh, uh, with Marcel Dassault, uh, and uh, the Falcon 20, or the Mestre 20, as it was, uh, Mestre 20, as it was called in France, had been designed to be both a business jet and a trainer for the French Air Force for training radio operators. Now, the significance of this was that the airplane was very strong relative to the other small jets that were being built. And um, I recognized that the airplane could be made into a freighter. In other words, it wouldn't, with a large payload on board, begin to crack and uh, have maintenance problems. And uh, Part 298, uh, when it was increased, was led us to take these small jets and put a nationwide hub and spokes network together uh, where any point on the network uh, connected through the clearinghouse, the hub, would be able to transfer items from one point to the other. And this was the original idea of FedEx right. can back I be in clear the 60s. About, can I be yeah. clear about this, Fred? The Civil Aeronautics Board ch are, changed its rules right. before you started operations. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that's what permitted it. That's what permitted it. Yes, and did, you, did you have any role in the change? Of oh, of course, right? yes, we were. You, might, you must explain this because we're going to be talking a yeah, lot today well, about your role I, you know, in these this is, I, I don't remember, I, I remember the uh, airline deregulation better than I do the Part 298, uh, uh, part, uh, uh, 298 changes for the very simple reason we, we weren't a driving force in that. It, it was being driven by the tour operators and the air taxis that wanted this changed. We sort of weighed in on it, but, but because we didn't, have any, we didn't have any presence, we didn't have any portfolio. Well, what's fascinating here is that you, you weren't providing any air taxi services. No, you, no, 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 did. I just recognize the, uh, I mean, it's somewhat analogous to some of the things that have had in technology where the FCC has made changes in the spectrum and somebody figures out that they can, they can use the uh, 
the regulation. There wasn't anything that was uh, prohibited by what it was said. It was designed to promote aviation that utilized these small airplanes. Whether you did what we did or do yeah. air taxi, but we weren't the driving force of that. To that extent, you weren't regulated in terms of what you did with the plane, no. as long as the plane fell below a certain Correct. threshold of size. And you met the rigorous safety standards and you met of the, the FAA. Standards. So, uh, as you mentioned, on uh, in the spring of 1973, after. Uh, 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 you know, a lot of uh, difficulty getting the thing put together, uh, this air ground overnight air express system to meet the needs of an, an automating society right. uh, was put in place. And uh, Did you attract any opposition to what you were trying to do then? For example, I, I think there may have been a petition to the Court of Appeals by the Airline Pilots Association against this rule change. Which oh, may, of course, uh, have preceded your... 298. Mm, against yeah. the, the alteration yeah. to raise the threshold. We weren't, uh, again, Brian, we weren't the driving force in 298. We just recognized that we could use it. Now, as I recall, I was up there and certainly spoke for it. And um, But uh, later on, in the push for airline cargo deregulation, we were a major force in it. And I spent innumerable days, and as you said in your initial remarks, um, testified many times over the, the wisdom of deregulating the, the uh, air transport industry, specifically air cargo, but that's a later day. And I, I do want to turn to that yeah. without too much delay because it's obviously of sure, enormous that's, significance. That's the big story. It's the yeah. big story for our discussion. Yeah. One thing that occurred to me when I was reading about the Part 298 and, yeah. and your activities under that part was in a sense, the overall competitive environment at that time, which is what I was introducing you to discuss, uh, was in a sense, you looked for regulatory exemptions, you looked for deft exploitation of regulatory loopholes, mm -hmm. rather than looking at a system of open competition. You were looking at the regulatory system and saying, we can do this and we can do that, we can't do the other and basically exploiting what you saw as the regulatory system. Yes, but again, I, we didn't have all that much opposition to what we were doing because nobody contemplated what we were going to do with it. They, as I said, it had been focused really on the air taxi and uh, what we would call commuter uh, activities, and that was really the focus of everybody in the, in the industry. When we came along, People thought that uh, you know that we were insane. They didn't understand, <laughs> so they didn't. They weren't worried too much about us because they thought we were just gonna gonna go away, and they didn't understand the uh, the fundamental raison d'être of FedEx or Federal mm -hmm. Express in those days. Yes. And uh, now, once it once we started demonstrating it. Uh, then it became clear, and that's when the big fight came on the deregulation. We did have a lot of opposition uh, at, at that time yes. because it was uh, no longer just a, a hypothetical or a, a little inconsequential operation. It was, it was being, it was becoming quite successful. Yes, well, FedEx now starts to peer above the parapet, and, correct, and, and exactly. to be visible. Exactly, and this is the issue of the. Air Cargo Deregulation Act, Absolutely. which I'd like to yeah. go into now, if yeah. we can proceed with that. And it, it is, in a sense, having looked at all of the background and I've read your testimonies, mm -hmm. and there were many mm -hmm. testimonies. Yes, absolutely. This is a really good insight, I think, into the political process. It's very hard to study the mm -hmm. political process and mm -hmm. to see, to find objective evidence as to how political actors make their decisions. Sure. What, what is it that goes into their heads that makes them come <laughs> out with particular political actions? Yeah. And you obviously, at some point, must have said to yourself, I've got to go to Congress and mm -hmm. I've got to talk to these people mm -hmm. about what's happening in the industry. And that was, uh, it, it seems to me to have been rather a bravura decision back then to march up to Congress as a small startup company and start to testify. How did that come about that you made those connections and appeared in Washington? And that's well, a very general question before yeah, we get to the specifics. No, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, question. And I have to say, had I remotely contemplated what would be involved in trying to change uh, a law, and, and for that matter, the whole <laughs> aviation regulatory environment, I probably never would have done the, the thing to begin with. 
But let me go back and, and focus your attention on, uh, on one thing that was of profound importance here. And that was the Arab oil embargo of 1973. Right. Um, the original Federal Express had both the, uh, the problem uh, and the, the, the benefit of being a network uh, solution to a network problem. Uh, think about someone coming into your office and saying, I have a fabulous new telephone service for you and you can speak to Atlanta and Charlotte and Albuquerque and name another 25 cities and sometime within the next few years we'll be able to hook you up to Los Angeles if you ever want to call. So a network is a synergistic um, system that operates on uh, the principle of n times n minus 1. Every time you add a, uh, a, a node to the network, the potential connections go up by that formula. So it's an exponential growth curve. But in the early stages of network, it's very difficult because a network doesn't exist until a network exists. So you had to have some minimal size. Right. Now because of that, we had uh, had not one, not two, but three separate, uh, independent, unimpeachable uh, marketing studies that verified the original conclusions I'd had when I was an undergraduate. It had become much more profound after my years in the service. Society was automating. We were starting to use computers and everything, cockpits of airplanes, in um, hospitals, in banks, and so forth. And the viability of the, that equipment and its usefulness to uh, the customers depending on it operating all the time. And that meant that you had to get items to and from the location needed, which could not be accurately forecasted, regardless of whether it was in a small town or in Manhattan or in Chicago or in Knoxville, Tennessee or wherever. And so that was the solution that Federal Express offered. If you could, let me yep. just ask you, if you could have done that with Olympic sprinters, you would have done it that way, right? Oh, sure, of course. The fact I mean, that it was an airplane yeah, was a did. question of speed, not yeah, it was just mode a question of operation. Of, question of speed, and I don't think we could have done it had the Falcon not been out there, as I, that's why I gave the background of this yes. sturdy little plane. Uh, again, nobody thought about making a freighter out of it. I mean, that was just a means to an end. And... Um, so, uh, in the fall of 1973, uh, we were really thrown a, a monkey wrench uh, into the gears of Federal Express because the Arab oil embargo took place. Right. And government uh, stepped in, regulated the purchase of fuel. You had to uh, make application to the government for fuel allocation based on your previous use ah. of fuel. So this was the Emergency Petroleum Allocation <coughs> Act Correct. of 1973. And uh, so that's really when I became more exposed to Washington than uh, even in the Part 298 was going up and making our case that this little fledgling carrier should be given fuel allocations. The other thing it did is it completely changed the economic input of the uh, original business case and the price of fuel went up dramatically. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that caused us to have to go back a couple of times for additional financing, not very much in the scheme of things, but very difficult. Uh, but other than that, the original business idea and the fundamental principles on, on Federal Express were proved every day because the, the traffic kept growing as we were able to sell it. So it was just a matter of time until the company became uh, profitable. But the cost of fuel made the use of multiple small airplane flights more costly than the original business plan had anticipated. Wingtip to wingtip, as you used wing to say. Wingtip to wingtip, as I used to say. Yeah. And, and so that probably, as much as anything, led us to uh, get into the deregulation conversation. Well, how did you get out of the problem that the act, the statute on allocation of petroleum, Used 1972 as its base. Yes. You weren't in existence in that. Well, there was a, there, it gave the administrator who was uh, John Sawhill, a very excellent public servant, uh, 
and uh, it gave the um, administrator uh, the ability to make exemptions if you could make a case. It was almost like the public convenience and necessity. So we had to go up and show them that we were carrying the most important items in commerce and we were moving parts and pieces for IBM that yeah. restored the computer's operation in San Angelo, Texas and hospital uh, device uh, machinery and so forth. And so they gave us the allocation based on the merits of our case. But well, you went up to Washington, you didn't testify before Congress on this. No, not Obviously. on that. You no, you had, to, you had to make the application to, I'm sure someplace in a dusty archive, those applications are still exist, but we made our case to them and they gave us the allocation. And you were saying that gave you some flavor of what it was like to deal with yes. the bureaucracy. Oh, absolutely. And I had to, I was up there so often I had to get a little uh, uh, apartment and uh, still maintain one up there for the, exactly the same reason because we've been in so many wars up there of one sort or another. Is it true that you still go to D.C. once a month? To you know, I to go to D.C. Uh, many times a year, but it's not just on congrats. There are all kinds of yeah. things up there, industry, association, plus my youngest daughter lives up there, <laughs> and uh, so that's a good excuse. The biggest battles have been won. They have, and I don't go nearly as much as I used to. Right, but in this case, this petroleum legislation yeah. was obviously a one-off response yeah. to a an unforeseen crisis. Mm -hmm. Did it in any way strike you as emblematic of the kind of regulatory environment with which you were now dealing? Oh, of course, because... In what uh, way? Yes, well, uh, the, the ultimate resolution of the issue was to simply let the market sort it out <laughs> with a pricing mechanism. And, and eventually that's what... You mean that's what should have happened? That's what should have happened initially. It mm -hmm. didn't happen, and mm -hmm. so it was a bureaucratic uh, yeah. uh, mess. Yeah. And... Um, Eventually, uh, some years later, all of the controls were removed and the market mm -hmm. reallocated, and that was that. But at so. that time, nobody would have thought that would happen. I no, and it's really very parallel to your focus of inquiry mm -hmm. on, on the rationale for airline deregulation and what really drove it over the, over the top. Well, let's move back now, since we've established that you now have a beachhead to Washington. Yep. You've met John Sawhill, and you've, yep. you've talked about the fuel allocation. But at some point around this time, FedEx wanted to move to larger aircraft. Yeah. You obviously, with the wingtip to wingtip, you decided this was a huge drain on resources and you needed to get bigger aircraft. Yeah. So you, uh, you try to expand the exemption. Is that correct? Did, uh, you, did you seek a... And, uh, no, the first thing we did, as I recall, is we attempted to, to, uh, to, to help architect a somewhat bigger airplane that had more cubic space and so a bigger slightly payload. more, a bigger payload, because the Falcon, even though it was under the 7,500 pound payload exemption, uh, the cubic space in the airplane was such we couldn't <coughs> get close to 7,500. So we worked with um, Canadair, who wanted to buy, uh, to build a, a new business jet, and our input was to make the airplane uh, very commodious, lots of cube, and we selected the, the diameter of the Convair 580, which was 106 inches, which was four abreast seating. And that executive jet had 7,500 pounds of payload with containers, after the containers, and plenty of cube. So that was our first Technical response. Solution. Technical solution. And interestingly enough, since you study aviation, because we had taken that Convair 580 fuselage diameter, some years later, Bombardier, which had acquired Canadair, put a, a more efficient engine on it, was then able to stretch the airplane into 50 seats, and that created the RJ industry. <laughs> And I create a history. Collateral effect of and, and, and what's funny about when, you, when uh, you're talking about dealing with history, I read a history of uh, <clears throat> either Canadair or Bombardier, and I was amazed to see that it never mentioned this in there. It was like this fuselage diameter came out of the blue that led to this, uh, the whole regional jet industry. But uh, that was our initial impression. And then... Uh, there began a very concerted academic discussion in Washington 
about the merits of uh, the regulation of the airline industry. We certainly didn't start that. We weren't uh, the prime movers in it. It was being propelled by the success of intrastate uh, airlines and academic studies like that done by Jim Miller, who I think was OM, head of OMB at the time, a very brilliant uh, economist. And Michael Levine had also. Mark Levine and, and mm -hmm. um, uh, Alfred Kahn had not taken over the CAB at that point in time. What, but as what I recall, time frame are we talking about? This would have been in the 75, 76 time frame. So the frame. Kennedy hearings were beginning to well, the Kennedy, ramp up. Uh, well, I tell everybody all the time the, 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 the real reason for airline deregulation is eyeglasses. And Teddy Kennedy, uh, who, as I recall, was. Uh, the head of uh, uh, one of the Senate committees yeah. had been a procedure, I think, administrative procedure. Whatever it was, yeah. he had become, from a consumer standpoint, fascinated about the regulatory regime that covered the sale of eyeglasses in Massachusetts. And uh, either at the state or the federal level, they had deregulated the eyeglass industry, which led to the to the startup of all of these things like Pearl Vision and so forth, and the price of eyeglasses went down by a factor of 80%. Mm -hmm. So he's exceedingly interested in this uh, from a consumer standpoint, right. that how uh, artificial regulation kept prices high and kept the, the product, or in this case uh, aviation, the service, out of reach of the average citizen. And that, that was what really drove him into the to the uh, uh, abiding interest that he had in aviation regulation. Is it fair to say that he was also looking <clears throat> for a, an eye-catching, to, to borrow a metaphor from your reference to Pearl Vision, an eye-catching idea for his campaign against President Carter, or is that stretching it too far? I, I don't know that to be the case. I couldn't, I, I couldn't say one way or another, but uh, he was a very uh, clever politician. It, it, yeah. it, he would have been... I think Mike uh, Levine may have said that. Well, that Mike uh, mm -hmm. would, would probably know better than I in that regard, but yeah. that was a... However it happened, he got very motivated <laughs> about the fact that market forces could drive the price of things down and help the average man. But you clearly jumped into the issue. Now. Oh, definitely. With so both why, feet. why, what was the incentivizing event? For well, you? the real incentivizing event was the fabulous success of Federal <laughs> Express. I mean, people, once we could absolutely demonstrate to people that we could pick up 50 items and deliver them to any address on the network the next morning, I mean, it, they were stunned. And, uh, so we were being uh, we were being overwhelmed by our success, and the price of fuel had gone up, and the economics of flying airplanes bigger than the Falcon, whether it was the the Canadair uh, uh, CL six hundred that I mentioned a moment ago, or some smaller uh, airliner, uh, there were just certain markets where it was silly to spend three DA-20 Falcons rather than a DC-9. So that's yes. what began our effort to seek an exemption. You before. actually sought an exemption? Oh, definitely. So you were constantly trying to avoid certified, certificated status? I, it, it didn't, we would have uh, contemplated certification, but with the uh, history of the CAB, as I mentioned, since 1938, they had never certificated a new trunk airline in all the years they'd been in existence. They had done supplementals, they had done regionals, they had done all cargoes. Uh, so we just felt that the potential of having an air carrier that served from San Diego to Portland, Maine, to Seattle, Washington, to Miami, it was just not going to happen. Mm. And it was an Air Express business. Remember, it wasn't just flying uh, baby chicks or uh, military equipment point to point as Seaboard and Flying Tigers was. It yeah. was this network. The bulk movement. That yeah, did, yeah, yeah, the bulk movement. It yeah. was this network with an integrated air ground pickup and delivery network. Exactly. And um, so we felt that the exemption was the better process because the, the regulation 
in 38, there actually was an exemption process. Nobody had ever successfully done it. And we proved again that it couldn't be done because we, we could filed, not be done. Could not be done because of the uh, resistance from the, um, from the incumbent carriers. I think at the time, you may have testified, in fact, I think you did testify to Congress that it could take between two and 10 years to get certified. Yes, correct. Or certificated, to use yeah. the correct term. It was a very long process, and we had a very process. good lawyer, Nat Breed, uh, Shaw, Pittman, Potts, and Trowbridge, a very venerable firm up there that had a lot of practice before the CAB, and uh, Nat became a good personal friend, and, and uh, Ramsey Potts was a legendary figure in Washington, been one of the, um, one of the uh, squadron leaders on the Ploesti raid in uh, World War II. So we, we definitely had good, good uh, attorneys who were very passionate about this, and we completely struck out in the exemption process. We had come to an agreement with uh, Hughes Air West, as I recall, they had a number of the initial short DC-9s, which weren't very attractive from the passenger standpoint, but because of a military uh, incentive program, they actually had cargo doors in them. So they were too small for the passenger business when the price of high fuel and the stretch DC-9 being available, and I think they had 12 or 15 of these things, and we had come to an agreement that if we could get this exemption, we would buy these DC-9s, and that's the basis on which we filed for an exemption to the certification process. And did the Civil Aeronautics Board attempt in any way to go to Congress and get authority to increase the possibility of an exemption? No. To raise any thresholds? No. Nothing like that no. occurred at the time? Not that I can recall. Yeah. And did you take the view that it wasn't worth applying for certificated status at the same time that you were lobbying for deregulation, that it just wouldn't be Efficient. Well, I think, I think uh, the advice that we were getting from the law firm that I just mentioned mm -hmm. is that the certification process was long, expensive, and would unlikely to be successful uh, given the ability of the incumbent carriers to, to fight against it, no matter whether it was meritorious or not. Was Alfred Kahn involved at this time with your effort to you know, I seek an exemption? Uh, no, I, I, uh, uh, this is where I get a little bit fuzzy, Brian. I mean, there was, uh, uh, Alfred Kahn was, of course, involved in all this heavily, and, uh, oh, he was from Chicago, a wonderful man that was the other head of the CAB that, uh, well, it's flown out of my head, but there were a lot of people that were sympathetic. I mean, they completely agreed but everybody also agreed that trying to get Federal Express certificated under the 38 Act was a virtual impossibility. Right. And at this point, the large combo carriers had about 80% of the air cargo business in the United yes. States. Mm -hmm. So they weren't interested in no, no, quite the contrary. And they had they had uh, you know cloakrooms full of lawyers whose <laughs> job was to file briefs talking about how this would be a mortal threat to their their interest, which they had done successfully since 38 against anybody who wanted an exemption or a certificate of public convenience and necessity. So what was the atmosphere in the District of Columbia at that time that you thought you might be able to make a pitch for some kind of air cargo deregulation? Yeah. Did, I don't know if the Kennedy hearings looked at air cargo, but somehow this issue got on the table. I don't remember how it did, other than the fact, as I mentioned, we were no longer uh, a hypothetical example of the absurdity of the regulatory regime. We were a living, breathing example of the unintended consequences of, of regulation that was too strict. I mean, here was obviously something that was being done that the public wanted very much because our traffic was going through the roof. So if anything ever met the test, the, the test of the public could be it's a necessity, we were it. Mm -hmm. And the public so, interest. And the public interest. So we became, I think, a fair way to put it would, would be uh, the poster child of, of your stifling innovation, your, your using uh, the wrong criteria for this thing. And a lot of people got on our bandwagon purely because of that. And, uh, and I think we made our case very well. 
Uh, did we you? did it in sh with shoe leather. I mean, we didn't have <laughs> we didn't have any public relations folks or or uh, advertising campaigns. We had one lobbyist who, like I had, had served in Vietnam as a Marine, uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Zorak, who had been a military legislative affairs guy, and uh, I kid John all the time. We hired him because he was cheap, <laughs> and so we had Nat Breed and Shaw Pittman, who really felt. I think from a principal's point of view that our case was, was uh, worth pursuing and Nat Breed was a, just, if you've ever read any of his briefs, he was a brilliant writer and, um, and I think they, they did a lot of work for us at a, at a very favorable price simply because they thought what we were trying to do was the right thing. And we're also mobilizing customers, there's, there's oh, the absolutely. famous postcard lobbying effort. Uh, no example. question. Yeah, uh, how that, that was, come about? Well, since we couldn't afford pre uh, big press campaigns and, and high-priced lobbyists and so forth, uh, you know, we got the people that could prove the public convenience and necessity on a de facto basis rather than a jury basis, just weighing in uh, with the Civil Aeronautics Board uh, supporting our request for exemption. But you say public convenience and necessity, but that's really a, a regulatory era concept. Yeah. What you were really looking for was a new fitness test which would be accompanied by open markets and well, open rate setting. That's, that's the direction we that's initially direction went in. You, what, yeah. we, what we originally asked for in the exemption <clears throat> to the CAB with the DC-9s was an exemption for having to have a certificate of public convenience in the Senate. So the postcard campaign actually was affiliated with, with that <coughs> Yes, that with that, that effort, okay. yeah. And, and I think we continued it as, as the legislative prospects improved. So can you talk about the initial bill which was, I think, known eponymously as the Federal Express. Bill. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, you we testified became, five times in 1976. Yeah, well, that didn't surprise Congress. me. Yeah, that didn't surprise me. I, we test. I was up there all the time, and the um, the uh, the merits of our case again were so strong because it wasn't hypothetical. I mean, we could show what was going on every day. And that's why I think we, we became the poster child for deregulating the cargo sector at least. Did you get together with the Flying Tigers Company no, at some I, point to draft this bill? Or no, they were adamantly against it. Okay. Yeah. Why? Well, they were a certificated carrier, right? That's why that they were adamantly against it. They had this mindset that, uh, you know, we're certificated and this is our uh, rice bowl and we don't <laughs> want anybody coming in it. So, no, it was funny because we eventually en ended up buying Flying Tigers. And, uh, but, they, no, they were very much opposed to it, a as almost the entire industry was. So it went to the House of Representatives. Who were you talking to in the, who was sponsoring this bill? Well, how did it come about? Do you remember any of the, the personalities, well, I, the I, politicians? I, there were, well, I remember uh, Congressman Mills, uh, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, was struck by our argument. Uh, our Tennessee delegation was certainly in favor of it. Um, you know, it's been so long ago, I, I, I can't recall any particular uh, folks, but we got somebody to introduce it, and but well, who drafted it? As I suppose that's my. Oh, question. I'm sure that would have been Shaw, Pittman, Potts, True. and Trowbridge. Yeah. So, you, so FedEx actually, or Federal Express, as it then was, submitted some kind of draft. Well, we certainly were in conversations with the uh, the staff in the. I don't even remember what the committee was. Now it's Public Works and Transportation, but whichever committee had the jurisdiction we convinced the committee chairman and his staff to introduce the bill. Were you on your own in, the, in this effort or in, well, in, in the I, industry? I no, mean. I think what was happening, uh, again, I keep using the term poster child for mm -hmm. deregulation. There was a much bigger cadre of people, including Senator Kennedy and, as I mentioned, Jim Miller and and uh, John Robson's, who I was thinking about a minute John ago. John Robson. Yeah. Who were firmly of the mind that the economic regulation of air transportation was not in the public interest, that it was making air transportation far too expensive. And they were focused uh, on the intrastate carriers. 
And when I had been in the uh, Marine Corps going to and from Southeast Asia, I had been stationed briefly in California. And there were two intrastate carriers, Air California and PSA. And of course, Southwest Airlines uh, had um, a set up shop in uh, Texas. And this had been bitterly contested by the certificated uh, federal carriers uh, that it was impermissible, that there was federal preemption and so forth. But Air California and PSA and Southwest had taken to the skies and they were producing air transportation over the same trip length compared to the certificated regulated federal carriers that was a fraction of what the federal carriers charged. Mm -hmm. And this had caught the attention of a lot of people, including uh, Jim uh, Miller, who wrote a very profound uh, book about it, as I recall. Uh, it caught the attention of Senator Kennedy because of his consumer orientation and what he had seen in the eyeglass industry. So our efforts down here, while they were enormously important to us, they were to some degree a sideshow to the much bigger issue that had bigger players uh, with more of a voice than we did. But we just became a part of this conversation more than anything else because it was so obvious it was stupid to prevent us from doing what we were doing. Well, some politicians must have seen this as a high profile demonstration to the public that this was worth doing. I, I mean, looking to FedEx to come and testify. I, I don't think there's any question about that. In fact, I think that a lot of these people that were much more interested in the passenger side of the house concluded that if they could do the cargo industry and the world didn't end in the uh, uh, succeeding few months, it would be a great uh, test case, and that's what in fact happened. Yes, but it could be a test case for deregulation, but it could yeah. also scare people Well, in the, deregulate, in the regulated passenger side of things. Well, it did, and there were a lot of people that were adamantly against yeah. the, the Federal Express exemption and then the deregulation of air cargo because they thought, quite correctly, that it was the camel's nose under the tent. Camel's nose under yeah. the tent. Well, as we close this first session, uh, let's just discuss what happened to the initial bill yeah. because it passed in the Senate, but then it seems to have died in the House Subcommittee on Aviation. And that was chaired at the time by Representative Glenn Anderson. Oh, of course. Of Glenn Anderson, how can I be from Long Beach, California? From Long Beach, California, yes. who accused you of floating special interest legislation. <laughs> well, I suppose he was right. But, but Even though you made a strong case and your testimony is yeah, very clear, you yeah, had you sure. responded point by point yeah. to eight criticisms yeah. of that bill. <laughs> and it's all there in the yeah. record. We got yes. it on microfiche. Yes, okay. Uh, he actually had some connection with the Flying Tigers because they yes, were based Yes, of course. There. Of course they were based there. Not that. to cast any aspersions <laughs> on Representative Anderson, but no. what, what, can you recall anything about that? about the failure of that bill when it well, got to the House? Well, no, I think it was stopped by uh, the opponents, which uh, right at the top of the list was, was the Flying Tiger Line. No that, question about it. How and did that he, was the connection. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn Anderson, that, I hadn't thought about him in a long time, rest his soul, but yeah, he was definitely, uh, uh, definitely in favor of remaining in the uh, old regime. And you didn't try to lobby him at the time. Maybe you did try to lobby him at the time. Sure. No, I would see him. And, you and would? Told, oh, of course, yeah. yeah. No, I saw, I would talk to anybody that listened. I never took anything personally. I just uh, tried to make our case. Well, I, I want to turn now, and we probably have to close the session and then turn to it in the next session, but perhaps you'll think about it in our little break. Uh, your actual congressional appearances and how you made the case for air cargo deregulation. Uh, is some general comment you want to make about okay. those appearances? Uh, sure. You, yeah. you actually, I, I'll correct what I said earlier. You appeared uh, s uh, six times in six months yeah. in that period. Yeah, well, which it was a crucial me. period. Yeah, I, know I was up there all the time. In 1976. And the act yeah. finally passed in 1977. Yeah. And presumably between 75 and 77, you continued to push in various ways. Yes, definitely. To, to yeah. Anybody that would listen to us, we would. Uh, we would uh, uh, make our case. And again, we certainly <coughs> didn't have the political clout of a Flying Tigers and, and yeah. uh, those people because they were much bigger, more established uh, yeah. uh, companies. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, we'll take a break now, Fred, and resume in the second session. Good. Thank you.